Hello. The ancient Greeks lived over 2,000 years ago. That's a long time. Obviously, no one can remember that far back. And no one took any film at the time to help tell us what they were like. So, how do we find out about the Greeks? Well, listen to that sound. Can you guess what it is? It's the sound of people digging. These people are archaeologists. That's a Greek word, appropriately enough. And what archaeologists do is dig for clues. They dig for clues about the past. Sometimes they find the remains of old buildings. And sometimes they find wall paintings. The archaeologist brushes the earth away with great care. He has to because this beautiful painting is over 3,000 years old. Sometimes they learn about the past by diving down to the bottom of the sea. At the bottom of the seabed is the remains of an old Greek shipwreck, and now they're investigating it to see what they can find. This ship was rich in its remains, but archaeologists are not usually as lucky as that. They have to work very hard and very patiently, and most of what they find might not seem very exciting at first sight. What's this? Just a small bit of broken pot. But even the tiniest object can be a vital clue. Indoors, the different pieces are sorted into groups. They'll try to fit them together to make up a cup or a vase. Some of the best finds are assembled in museums. These people are working in the British Museum in London. Here we have a base, and I need to find some bits for it. Got a ring, that's a bit to go on the ring, yes, that bit goes there. But I don't know whether that one will go in, yes, that one needs to go in first. I've still got another piece holding me out here. Oh, this little piece will go in first, yes, that goes in there. That's quite nice. Yes, little bit first, this one next, and this large bit third. Yes, that's it. Now I can stick. Much of what we know about ancient Greece comes from looking at the paintings on the vases. But before that can happen, the jigsaw of pieces has to be fitted together. Putting together a vase like this can take hours of painstaking work. So let's give him a helping hand with some music. this pot but we have a good idea of how it was made because the art of pottery has changed very little in thousands of years Pottery is made out of clay. 
a lump of clay is thrown onto a spinning surface and then it is shaped by hand. Meanwhile, another man paints the pots and decorates them with delicate patterns. what a modern Athenian pottery looks like. But now we're going to travel back in time to an ancient Athenian pottery. It belongs to a man called Crito, and today he's brought his young niece and nephew along to show them round the works. Well, no sin, we do everything here. Drinking cups for your dad and his friends, plates for the kitchen, mixing bowls for wine, storage jars for the olives. And Xanthia here is painting a perfume jar. And that's Thrasius. He's working on a jug. Fascinating, isn't it? He's a real artist, Thrasias, the best potter in Athens. And Xanthia is the best painter. Is that true? Well, it's what I tell the customers, so it must be true. Now, look at that brushwork. You won't find many men painters with a touch like that. Do you notice the colours she's using? Mostly we paint red on black, but we've started to do a bit of this white stuff. I can't say I like it much myself, but it's getting to be all the rage. And I have to admit, it looks all right when Xanthia does it. How do you decide what to put on the pottery? Oh, well, some people like everyday scenes, like this one, and others prefer tales from the past. Now, you two, being well brought up children will know your Greek stories, won't you? Well, you should do. There's no excuse for not knowing your Greek legends. <laughs> now, come on in. Who's this? Um, Hephaestus. That's right. You can tell him by his axe. Now, what's going on in the picture? Don't know. I do. It's a Phoebe being born. Good boy. Hephaestus has just split Zeus's skull open. And there he is, surveying his handiwork. And there's Zeus, looking surprised, and you can't really blame him, can you? Ah, now, here's one you should recognize. Medusa. Well done. You can tell Perseus by his winged boots. He's just chopped off Medusa's head, and now he's off on his next adventure. What was that? You don't know. Well, it's high time you did. Uh, come on, you two. Uh, take a seat. Uh, perch yourselves up there. That's right. Now then. Let's see. 
Some people say that Perseus flew three times round the world after he cut off Medusa's head. Well, he may have done. All I know is that he came down at last in the land of Lord Atlas. Who was Atlas? Atlas was a titan, one of the giants, and he had a thousand flocks of cattle and golden orchards, golden branches, golden leaves, golden fruit, all gold. He also had a mean streak, and when Perseus came down into his kingdom on his tired wings, Atlas was none too pleased. There was some story he'd heard about a young hero who might steal his kingdom from him, so he told Perseus to fly straight back where he came from. Perseus was so angry he took Medusa's head out of the bag, being very careful not to look at it himself. And before the giant knew what was happening, he had been turned into a mountain. It's there still, Mount Atlas. They say that the rocks are his bones, and the trees on the mountainside are Atlas's hair and his beard. After he'd rested, Perseus took off again, and he flew homewards over a great desert, and drops of blood fell out of the bag that contained the Gorgon's head. And where they fell on the sand far below, they turned into serpents, vicious and deadly, just like Medusa herself. By now, Perseus was nearly home, and coming down lower and lower, he turned a corner of the coast that was close to the island where his mother was waiting for him. Almost home, but not quite, for there below him was a young woman chained to a cliff. She was weeping, as you might expect, and when Perseus landed beside her, her story was... soon told. It was a desperate story. She was a princess. Andromeda was her name. And her mother, Queen Cassiopeia, was not only wonderfully beautiful, but also wonderfully vain. Proud, foolish Cassiopeia. She had boasted that she was even lovelier than the sea nymphs, creatures who live among the waves, and are generally thought to be about as beautiful as anyone could be. The sea nymphs were the servants of the sea god, Poseidon, and he was very angry with Cassiopeia. He said that if the king and the queen wanted to save their land from his wrath, they must chain their daughter to the cliff as a sacrifice to a sea monster that he, Poseidon, would send. So now Andromeda was waiting to die. And there on the shore stood the king and the queen, and they were weeping too. And already the sea was trembling against the rocks, as if some vast and terrible creature was on its way. Perseus flew across to Andromeda's parents, and they came to a quick agreement. Perseus would save Andromeda from the monster, and in return they would give Andromeda to him as his wife for he had fallen instantly in love with her, and she would return home with him. Agreed, agreed, they cried. But even as their tears stopped, the sea boiled and burst against the rocks, and they saw the monster. It was a huge swimming dragon, a vast serpent. It had the head of some great terrible fish, all teeth and burning eyes. It was everything horrible, filling the whole sea with the twisting and thrashing of its immense green body, and it headed straight for the cliff. This time Perseus did not use Medusa's head, for how could he be sure that Andromeda would not look at it as well? Instead, he determined to attack from above. The monster was so intent on its prey that he never even saw Perseus as he hurtled downwards and drove Athena's sword into the monster's shoulder. For one awful moment it rose out of the sea and seemed to stand there bellowing with rage and snapping its great teeth as if it wanted to rip the air to pieces. Then, very slowly, it slipped back lifeless under the waves. 
and Andromeda was saved. You know how it is sometimes with people when they're in trouble. They promise anything, anything. And when the trouble's over, they're sorry they did so. Well, so it was with Andromeda's father and mother, the king and the queen. You see, Andromeda had been promised to another, a man named Aginor. And the marriage of Perseus and Andromeda had barely begun when Agino appeared with his friends. Oh, they were angry and they were armed to the teeth. Perseus must die, said Agino, for he has stolen my bride. And so suddenly it was Perseus against them all. There were swords raised, javelins ready to be hurled, arrows about to be fired. Perseus, it seemed, was about to die a hundred times from a hundred hands. But no, he called Andromeda to stand behind him, her back to him, and he drew Medusa's head from the bag. So those raised swords never fell. Those javelins were never hurt. Those arrows were never fired. Not one of them, Agino or any of his friends, ever breathed again. All their murderous hatred of Perseus was turned into stone. And now, with Andromeda by his side, Perseus journeyed the last few miles home to find his mother, Danae, in hiding. For the king, Polydectes, the very man you remember who had sent Perseus for Medusa's head, the same king, Polydectes, still wanted to marry Danae against her wishes. He and his friends were feasting when Perseus appeared in the palace. Polydectes, cried Perseus, I bring you the gift you asked for. I bring you Medusa's head. And they didn't believe him. They laughed at him. They shouted. They called him boy. And Polydectes cried, Show us what's really in the bag, boy. Show us what a liar you are, Perseus. And they all opened their mouths to laugh and shout and call names at him. So Perseus did as Polydectes asked him to do. He opened the bag and he took out the head and he held it up. And those open mouths never laughed again. And none of them ever shouted again. For they too were turned to stone. As for Perseus, Danae, and Andromeda, they walked free from the palace. They were ready to start a new life on their island home. And that's the story of Perseus and Andromeda. Do you like it? Yes. So do I. One of our best sellers, that is. Yes, you can always sell a vase with Perseus on it. And what became of Medusa's head? Ah, well, Athene claimed back her shield from Perseus, and she took Medusa's head and stuck it in the middle of her shield to frighten her enemies, which is where you'll find it, on her statue in the Parthenon. Come on, let's go and have a look at it. I've had enough of pots and vases for one day. Won't take us long to get there, so the walk will do us good. It really is a very remarkable statue. I've always admired the work of Wagner. He does really, really wonderful things. Heroes of old, heroes of Greece, heroes of nature, whose fame will ever cease. Theirs is the glory, a never-ending story. Praise to the heroes of Greece. Heroes of old, heroes, heroes, heroes of ancient.
Amém.